body case. Don't push me or it'll explode. And, and, and so, and, and a lot of the energy and the anger in hip hop, and, and, but also I guess the artistry is about, um, these are realities which are unpleasant, uncomfortable, um, and I want to survive. I, 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 you know, grow, you grow up in Compton, you know, the, between the Crips and the Bloods, I want to survive. But, and I want to somehow get through this without becoming a crypt or a blood, but it's hard, and, and, and don't push me, because then I'll explode. And, and it, it is, it, that in and of itself is a heroic act. It, it's it's the, the heroism of ordinary life, the heroism of trying to live an ordinary life under extraordinary pressure and under extraordinary stress. <coughs> Uh, there's a lot more to say. Um, I did promise that I would make some connection with Snape. That's <laughs> 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 my Facebook page. I've got to yeah. say something. Uh, Snape and, and are there any star, are there any Trekkies here? I, I mentioned uh, uh, Q um, um, uh, in Star Trek. Um, Q is a little bit it's easier. Actually, you know, there's something about the gods, and you and I discussed this yesterday. We were preparing, preparing for this. Um, the gods are enthralled by human life and are jealous of it, it seems, in some way. But they don't quite get it. They, because they don't die, they don't get the importance of, of the kinds of sacrifices that we, that we talk about. Uh, and and uh, I guess I, I think of Snake as another, uh, uh, the, almost the pri a prime uh, anti-hero hero, because he, he, he hates the person, the child that he's, that he's saving. He loves the child's mother uh, and uh, has to murder um, as an act of love. He has to, you know, Dumbledore. He has to kill Dumbledore as an act of love so that Dumbledore doesn't have to die a cruel death. It's almost like he's, he's the, the guy that, you know, that helps people to die because they have a terminal disease or something like that. And I, and I, and I am intrigued by that, by that uh, having, having to walk in such darkness, as it were, in such, in such pain uh, and still be good. I think it's a, it's a hard task. And Q is in love with human life, just as the, the Greek gods are in love with human life, it seems to me. And, and the desire to be human and to follow them around and see what they do. What are they going to do next? And then they go off. And you say Mars gets wounded and he goes off whimpering to Zeus. Oh, you're my son. I hate you, but I'll, I'll help you get, I'll put some ambrosia on your, on your arm and, and make sure you're okay. Well, you know, that, and, and that's why the gods cannot be heroic. That's also why animals cannot be heroic. We talk about hero dogs and horses who rescue their, their owners, and they're, and, 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 but the difference, gods can't be heroic because they suffer no consequences. Um, and so, as, as Columbia was saying, there's in book five, Ares, or Mars, is stabbed by Diomedes in the, in the stomach. He has a horrific wound. He screams. He screams. He ascends into heaven to Mount Olympus. And then Zeus has uh, Apollo or one of the other gods sprinkle some ambrosia on <laughs> his heel. And he just goes laughing and he's singing. He gets he a suffers no, plate eats, a, eats dinner. Right. And so he <laughs> suffers no consequence. And therefore, he cannot be heroic. He can be powerful. He can be mighty. He can be, but he can't be heroic. Well, humans and gods share one quality. We are self-aware. We know we will die. We, we know that's reality. Animals are not self-aware. But we share something with animals that, that gods don't share. We are mortal. We will die. And so humans live in this in-between, between gods and animals. We are self-aware like gods. We are mortal like animals. And what does that make us? It makes us tragic because we know what fate has in store for us. There's nothing we can do about it. And the, the one question we all have in our own lives, how will we live our life so that we can say when the end comes, we've lived a good life? Harry Potter answers that question. The warriors in the Iliad have to answer that question. And the uh, Grandmaster Flash is answering that question too. I think it's a, it's a one, one thing I love about hip hop in particular is that it can change its mind halfway through and say, well, yeah, I messed up, and let me fix that. And 
and do it differently. And, and uh, I, I actually, in, in, a part of my class I taught at Harvard on hip hop, invited Chuck D and Public Enemy to come to the school. And they had, at that time they had been um, um, putting out some anti-Semitic songs. And I, and I just sat in there and said, wait, you know, Jews haven't hurt you, what is wrong with you? You know, uh, it's about, you know, he said to me, you know, you're right. And, and I don't know whether I was one of many or what, but he did not, no more anti-Semitic songs mm -hmm. came out of him. You know, to be able to change like that in the midst of a thing, he said, you know, it's like a habit that he hadn't thought about. Uh, so that was, it was good to say that. And, and, I, and I think Jay-Z does that as well, but I won't go into that because I want, I want everybody to talk now. So why don't we open it up yeah. for, for questions? Okay, somebody I'll say something. <laughs> All right, you got it. I have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, as far as like the fact that that animals can't be her heroic because they don't, I think they're aware of death. I mean, elephants have graveyards that they visit to mourn their dead, and mothers will pretty much self-sacrifice to protect their young. I think they know what they're doing, that they're risking their own life. But um, and also the idea that like gods, only humans can be heroic. I, it's maybe controversial, but I think Satan is the hero of Paradise Lost. I mean, so I think to say that like death is the only consequence, well, what about eternity in the absence of God? I think that's a consequence too. I think there are just different ways of suffering. I mean, who is it? Sisyphus, who has to like roll up the oh, yeah. boulder? Like yeah. that sucks, I'd rather die. <laughs> I think, I don't know, I think it's more complex. Well, but, but you have that option. You say you'd rather die. Gods don't. Satan is clearly the most um, articulate, articulate and three-dimensional character in, in Paradise Lost, and so in, in that sense, he is sort of um, attractive. I mean, go back to the Iliad. Hector is the most attractive character. Most people like Hector, but Achilles is actually the most complex and the most heroic character, and 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 that's a sometimes difficult to grasp. Elephant burial grounds and, and a sense of loss, um, I think many animals understand, and I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a biologist or a zoologist, so I, so I will stand corrected, but from what I've read, they understand loss. When, 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 a, when you leave your dog or your pet, they mourn you when you're gone, and when you come back, they're glad to have you. They, un they understand the absence and the presence. So elephants understand the absence of the mother or, or the loved one because there's no longer presence. But the fact that it's permanent, the fact of what it means, the fact that it's a stage of life, and that in fact we all have to die so that new people can live, all of that sort of self-awareness about death and life, no one has, has said animals possess with us. Gods might possess the knowledge, but they don't possess the experience. And so when Philippians said, are gods sometimes jealous of men? I think they are for the very reason you've indicated. Eternity can be boring or burdensome. It can either be a burden like Sisyphus or it can be boring when all you have is just constant music. And, and you look in, in the Iliad. Let them talk, come on. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, in Britain just this week, someone did say one of the medical faculties decided that animals are sentient. That's, that's, that's on its way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I came a little bit late, so I don't know if you already, if you already talked about this. Um, but I'm curious about your, what your ideas are, or other, people, other people's ideas are, about why we as a society look to heroes. Why do we need heroes? Do we need heroes? Good question. <laughs> That answer. Uh, I, I actually have a problem with our, the hero worship that, that, that our society seems to have. We're picking on somebody and expecting them to be perfect and then get upset when they're, when they're imperfect and all that. Remember, I love Star Trek, but I don't go to any of the Star Trek, um, whatever they, those things they have, because I don't really care just to meet Picard or whoever they are. I don't get and I, and I because I don't get it, I, I, I'm not the best person to answer it. Uh, maybe somebody else can, can, can someone respond to that? Yeah, actually, I was, that was a point that I wanted to bring up and that you, you added. Um, I think we admire heroes because we find it that uh, their selfishness to protect their legacy is a form of living on forever. And so when we see an example of someone actually being selfish enough to protect their legacy, we, we kind of want to have it for ourselves. 
And so, yeah, I do find it very necessary to have heroes because we all have that choice to, to, to live on forever with the life that we live here and leaving a good legacy here. So I think when I hear the story of Achilles protecting his, his reputation and his legacy, you know, that's kind of what we all are trying to do and, and achieve is you know, protect that. Well, that's similar to the, the very first conversation we had about this in the series where the Phi Beta Kappa Secretary, John Churchill, and Vice uh, Dean of the Barrett College, Peggy Nelson, commented on that. And, and the sense of that, and Johnny, you can correct me if I'm missing this, but you were there also, I think, said something about, there's something about that connection between the heroic and the superhuman um, that helps us better understand why we need and why we create heroes. And the example that was used uh, was Lance Armstrong. And Lance Armstrong, in many eyes, was quite heroic but there was something about his heroism that was actually quite superhuman. And on some level, people knew that. People knew that. And when he fell, and part of the, 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 the tragedy of Lance is that he denied that, as opposed to sort of accepting it. But as, as Peggy Nelson pointed out, nobody can do this on his or her own, all these, these first place uh, positioning without some kind of enhancement. It's just that when you find out about the enhancement, that's when you fall to glory. So society is sort of complicitous in creating heroes and then watching them fall based on these sort of unreal expectations. And in many ways, that superhuman is that constant sort of thriving for something that battles mortality. So when you talk about human enhancements and you talk about all these people who have created these wonderful, wonderful heroic ideals, that's precisely what it is. An ideal can't be reached. If it's reached, it's no longer the ideal. And so there's something that we create because we have to do that, and then we watch people fall because nobody's perfect. That was his take on it. One of the things you said about gods is that they can't be heroes because they're immortal and because they can't be defeated. Uh, if, if that's the case, uh, what about Superman and Spider-Man and Batman? They can't be defeated either. I don't know if they're immortal. Well, but actually, that, that's a great question. I mean, I. I Superheroes, the comic book superheroes, are in fact gods because they possess all the qualities of gods. They're, they're, well, they, they're immortal, and but most importantly, they never change. And one of the, I don't know how many of you are comic fans, but one of the great revolutions in comics over the past, I'd say from 19, no, I'd say from, from 2000 to today, is the uh, Marvel, DC, and the other comics have brought change into their character. That's interesting. They, they, uh, some, some superheroes have even died. I think in, I think in, the, Mar in the DC Universe, Flash mm -hmm. died, I don't know. But, but um, and they've changed because they realized that was a flaw. Mm -hmm. Superman was the same for 50, 60 years. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, he's the same as Batman. I mean, the same story, the same character. And they change him, and so now he's the Dark Knight. He's much. Mm -hmm. exactly. where, where is Robin? Robin yeah. is gone. He's now has his own his own <laughs> magazine. I mean, yeah. and, and so that's <laughs> and, and so they they realized they had to do something. But look at the gods in, in mythology. Yeah. Not just Greek mythology. They are eternal, unchanging. Yeah. Once they reach that point at which they are gods, they don't grow. And that's the thing about humans. That's the thing about mortality. Yes. We will die, but getting there, we grow, we learn, we become, we move from children to adults, and then we grow older. But we pass on our experience to our children and our grandchildren. That's something that unique, which we we share with animals. We, it is part of our mortality, that ability to grow and learn and change. Gods don't have. The heroes in uh, Harry Potter, I think, change. They, yes, at least our view of them changes. Absolutely. That's a good, yes. The novelistic often requires change, almost, as opposed to everything. Yes. So on the, on the point of comic book heroes, I'm wondering, um, in creating this talk, what kind of interested you in, in these three things? Um, and because, you know, a comic book, some comic book writers like Stan Lee uh, drew heavily from uh, Greek um, North uh, mythology. Uh, you mentioned Tolkien, who has a, a lot of these same themes in his book. Um, talked a little bit about Star Trek. Uh, you know, a lot of things in our pop culture draw from a lot of these old uh, ideas. 
So uh, when you were you know thinking of uh, thinking of, of things like Harry Potter and um, Grandmaster Flash, and you know, what what drew you to those? What what made you think you know this is well, what I want to incorporate? Well, we both are in love with the Iliad. Okay. <laughs> that's that's not the beginning. Uh, well, he loved he loved Harry Potter, and I love Grandmaster Flash. So. <laughs> I mean, I, why do I love Harry Potter? I think um, I also love the Lord of the Rings. I, I I think that Tolkien and J.K. Rowling are two of the greatest. Tolkien of the late 20th century and Rowling's of the of the early 21st century. What Rawlings was able to do to get young people to read in their hundreds of thousands, in their millions, is absolutely incredible. And she did it because those stories, you're exactly right, they tap into arch-typical, archetypal um, uh, understandings of, of good and evil, of morality and, and, and wrong. How many of you watch Game of Thrones on HBO? Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones? Yeah. One of my criticisms, I, I, now I watch it and, and I love it but I also criticize it. I criticize it because there's no moral compass in Game of Thrones. It is a game, and everyone is trying to get onto the Iron Throne, and every, but there's no moral compass. I don't, know how, I'm, I don't want to spoil it, but in the last episode, this Sunday, we see the Kingslayer do one good thing. I mean, he tries to save Brienne of Thorne, and then what happens to him? I'm not going to reveal what happens to him, but it's awful. <laughs> but see, I, got, I have to interrupt here because I have tried and tried and, and feel embarrassed that I can't get into Game of Thrones and I have given it up. It's hopeless for me. So you may have, you may have told me why. Because there is, I, there's no moral. What, what's going on? Why do I care? And, and, and Epic, you know, I, one of the things they wouldn't allow me to do in my doctoral dissertation defense, you can't define the, they said you cannot account for the use of a word. But since I'm no longer, since I have my PhD, now I can define it. <laughs> An epic is a long narrative describing the origin, nature, or destiny of a people, group, you can put anything you want, gender, people, group, city, whatever, um, incorporating, incorporating the hero, a hero or the heroic ideal and depicting the cultural worldview. When you divide that up, those are five different things. And part of the worldview is what is good, what is bad, mm -hmm. what should I follow, what should I not follow, where where am I to go when I when I don't know where to go, and and that it's that part that you're talking about when you say what is that heroic uh, quality, uh, what is it, what is it in the culture, and I would add my secret, the secret sixth one that that that, that, that I'm not a, that I won't add with the other one is that and uh, that it, that somewhere in the epic it it contradicts all of that, it contradicts itself somewhere. Use the ones that we keep on reading and reading and reading. Homer, Virgil, Dante, Milton, my favorite dead white men. <laughs> where, where are the women in this discussion? Oh, yeah. They're in Game of Thrones, that's where they are. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're in Games of Thrones. The women in Game of Thrones, I mean, the TV show is different than the books. In the books, the women are stronger. I but do like the woman. The, the women, <laughs> you better watch out for them. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> awesome. Are they behaving like men? They're behaving, very differently. they're behaving like women who are making their own choices. Okay. I don't really want to say that that's right. being like a man because I don't okay. want to think that. Because <laughs> <laughs> the ideals that were cited here seem to have this sort of masculineness. Right. I mean, uh, one of the great Christian things Lama's about his daughter, uh, the, the Norwegian uh, novel by Secret Onset, is a woman, it's an epic, uh, that, in my opinion. That, that's the one I use when I, when I, when I want to talk about an amazing epic by a woman, about a woman, and with, with, with female values, and yet depicting the entire society through women. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about Game of Thrones is that the women, most of the women are strong, but they have different ways of being strong, which is great. You know, you have Arya, who may be, you know, you may define Arya as being strong like a man. She learns how to fight with a sword. She learns to survive. She gets kidnapped 20 million times and still like finds a way to be successful and survive. And then there's her sister Sansa, who's very ladylike and very polite, and she's learning how to survive in the court, which is very different, but it's no less perilous. And if anything, I would say Sansa's in more trouble. It's much more terrifying being in the court than being, you know, off fighting people. And you have Cersei, who's the queen, who is evil but powerful and successful and yeah, you have, you have these women who are individuals. They're not just like, oh, they're strong because they're acting like a man. They're strong because they're finding their own way to be strong. And it's mm -hmm. really interesting. I have to admit, I did like the women as far as I read. I didn't read it. I, I, didn't, I haven't seen any of the movies or TV, but I loved, the, loved them in the 
Well, but then I got to the point where I couldn't. It's a lot. <laughs> well, you know, and one of the anomalies in the uh, in, in Homer is that it's it's ostensibly a poem about war, and yet the god of war is a buffoon, and, and he is the least respected god Ares in, in the whole poem. Yet Athena, who is the most respected god after Zeus, I mean, she is. Um, the most powerful god after Zeus, and she has a greater impact on the action than any other god in the poem. And she's a warrior goddess. She wears armor, she fights, and when she fights Ares, she always wins. She always defeats him. And it, it, it's, it's sort of interesting, and, and frankly, I, I mean, a lot of people have written about it. What was Homer saying? What, what, what was he getting at? Um, with this incredible character of of, Ares, of, of Athena. Well, one of the things in the Iliad uh, in which Homer downplayed, if, if, he, if he exalts Athena, he downplays Thetis. Thetis is Achilles' mother. Thetis, in, in Greek mythology, was a very powerful goddess. She actually saved Zeus when Zeus was, uh, when the other gods rebelled against him, and that's why Zeus owes her a favor and helps her. Um, she is she is a transformative goddess in Greek mythology. Um, she, there, are, there are some suggestions she has power over death, but Homer downplays that because he doesn't, he doesn't, that doesn't fit in within his theme. But one of the interesting things Homer does do, and other women, um, Hecuba, the mother, Andromache, Helen, who yeah, is an incredibly three-dimensional woman. I mean, she is, the most beautiful woman in the world, but she's also the most circumscribed. I mean, she, men want to possess her and own her, and, and, and she has to deal with that. And also, Homer allows her self-awareness that she was infatuated by Paris. Paris is this handsome, young, incredibly dashing young guy. She was infatuated by him, and, and Aphrodite wanted it to happen, and so he took her away. And now she looks at Paris, she looks at what she's done, and she has regret. And she and she she curses him out, and she says, "Why did I ever go with you?" And and it, it, she she's a three dimensional character. And in, 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 in the the women in the Iliad, although they're not heroic the way the men are, they are present. They mm -hmm. are strong. Hecuba, the mother of Hector, is incredibly present. And after Achilles kills Hector, she says, "I wish I could eat out his." liver raw. <laughs> I, 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 I would eat it raw if I could. She's so angry. I mean, well, Hermione in uh, Harry Potter is very, very strong. Yes, yes. But, yes, you're exactly right. But not heroic. It's but not very, very strong. And exactly. But notice, not in uh, Harry, you're exactly right, but I was going to comment on The Lord of the Rings. In The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien does not have strong female characters in The Lord of the Rings. He does in The Silmarillion. In the movie, the movie actually, the movies actually make some of the female characters in the Lord of the Rings yeah. stronger than they are in the, in the book. Yeah, yes. the, yes, it's a man, it's a male. Yeah. Yeah. Any <laughs> final burning comments or, or, or observations before we dismiss? Does, does Harry Potter need Voldemort to be a hero? Does Achilles need Agamemnon to be a hero? In other words, do heroes need villains in order to be heroes? Yeah. I, I bring the spot. I forget the wonderful poem someone wrote about that, about the, oh, the, the, the uh, uh, witch. In the, in the fairy tales, but what would you do without me? If I hadn't oh, been yeah, here, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. I mean, I mean, there may be many heroes around who simply never have enough. You know, one of the things Bill Clinton used to say when he was president, he wanted to have some crisis to deal with so he could show how great a president is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, let's thank our guests. Uh,